Okay, so let's start the afternoon uh, session. The first speaker is Andrea Simone. Uh, so the last time I gave a talk about some polarized PMDs and fragmentation functions, I ended up in the emergency room. So <laughs> let's see if it goes better now. All right, so... Yeah, I was not the organizer's fault. Um, I want to start thanking yeah, the organizers for the possibility to give a talk here. It's very nice, and also to start the session. Um, okay, so... The outline of the talk is the following. Since uh, I'm the first one here in the afternoon, I'm going to tell the generalities about uh, PMDs and their evolution to prepare the ground for the discussion. And then I'm going to present like the first attempt to a global feat of unpolarized PMDs. Uh, and I'll discuss um, also the predictive power of PMDs or on the, on the contrary, the relevance, uh, the kinematic dependence of the relevance of an unpolarized correction to PMDs. And then we are going to talk about the future. So uh, I think we are all familiar with this table, so I will not spend too much time about it. We have uh, eight different leading twist TMD PDFs for the quarks. Uh, according to the polarization of the quark or the hadron that we are considering, we have different objects. And I'm sorry. Oh, no. OK. No. <laughs> I don't want to have the arrow. Oh, in the right. Great. All right. <laughs> so, okay, I, I was, as I was saying, uh, these functions, they encode all the possible spin and momentum correlations between the quark and the hadron. So they're quite interesting objects. Uh, I'm going to focus about F1 for quarks here. Uh, also, uh, I will say something about the gluon thing, the F, and the, the unpolarized spin interpretation function. I will leave all the other functions to Elena. She's going to talk about polarized uh, PMD PDFs. Okay, so the, the key for doing phenomenology with this object is to see the matrix elements that we had in the previous uh, emerging from some kind of factorization theorems. If we want, if we want to do uh, phenomenology, we have to be entirely sure that we are looking at uh, sensible observables that can be factorized into the matrix PDFs. So these functions here are uh, rather special in a sense because um, they have three kind of divergences. The infrared divergences are there, it's the signal of the ground distance QCD. Then we have uh, two different divergences that we can renormalize, the UV divergences and the light divergences. Uh, the normalization procedure for these two um, types of divergences give rise to two additional scales in the, in, a, in, the TMD, in the TMD PDFs. So renormalizing the UV divergences, you get the, uh, the mu dependence and renormalizing Light coming divergences, you get the, the zeta dependence in the, in the TMD PDFs. Okay, so um, if, we, if we want to talk about evolution of TMDs, as I said, we have evolution in two scales. The evolution in mu is driven by this exponential factor here, uh, where gamma f is the anomaly dimension of the TMD PDF. That's when we normalize the TMD PDF to, to, to the UV divergences. Uh, the evolution in zeta is driven by this other kernel, k, uh, which is the college sort of kernel. Um, this gamma f and k can be computed in, in perturbation theory to have the power expansion strong. Um, so this is the, let's say, the way you implement the evolution. For the, for the input TMD PDF, you can also do a perturbative calculation at low uh, bt, where bt is the Fourier function of the moment. So these coefficients C here are, again, power series in alpha strong. You can calculate them, and they are convoluted with the uh, collinear part of distribution functions. So everything is very nice. You can calculate C, you can calculate gamma F and K, but uh, what, what happens is that we need corrections for this uh, operator product expansion here and for the uh, kernel K uh, at large bt. Okay, so the F and P factor here is uh, what corresponds in, in momentum space to the distribution in intrinsic quantum momentum. This sub K is the correction to the, uh, the K and it's the, uh, what, what we usually refer to as the uh, non perturbative part of the theory. These two guys uh, are what we are after when we think of the behavior. Okay, so if we have data, you, you want to calculate uh, 
some extent C, K, and gamma F, and then you fit T sub K and F and T. F and T. Okay. Um, regarding global analysis of unpolarized TMDs or analysis in general, this is more or less a selection of the results uh, that we know about unpolarized TMDs. The most two recent ones are the FIT, uh, the so called Pavia 2017 FIT, and the FIT by uh, Shimeni and Vladivirov. Um, since Ignacio is here and he's going to talk about it, I, I leave everything to, to this talk regarding mm -hmm. the last line. And I'm going to talk about the second last line. Okay, the second last line, as you can see, uh, is the first FIT that involves. Uh, uh, same inclusive DIS, Trendian, and Z boson production data. Uh, there, is, there was also this fit in, in 2014, but uh, with only one, say, being in X and Q squared uh, involved. So the data sets and the kinematic coverage is the following in the X and Q squared plane. Uh, we have data for semi inclusive DIS from Compass, Hermes, and fixed target, uh, fixed target data for, uh, for Trellian from Tevatron and also Z-boson production. Okay, so uh, what's missing, uh, as we already said many times, is unpolarized data for the plus and minus integrators. That would be crucial for analysis of TMD uh, fermentation functions to get uh, independent information about the uh, TMD fermentation functions. Okay, so the fit, uh, the fit involves Hermes compass, Trellian fixed target in Z-boson production, and uh, so it's an almost a global fit of uh, unpolarized uh, work TMDs. It includes TMD evolution to a certain extent. It's based on the bootstrap uh, FICTI methodology, or what we refer to uh, as the uh, replica methodology. Uh, we managed to include some kinematic dependence in the uh, intrinsic, uh, in the intrinsic part of the TMDs. And I want to make a reference to one of the talks that I'll show this morning uh, later. And we explored uh, uh, a different assumption with respect to the, the, the Gaussian approximation in the, in the intrinsic transverse momentum. So what, what we have to improve uh, is the, say for, for sure, the accuracy of the evolution, because it's not the state of the art. Uh, also, we don't have information on TMD fragmentation functions. So as soon as the plus minus state is available, we have to improve it. Uh, we only deal with the very low transverse momentum part in principle, so there is no fixed order calculation and no and we match into the high transverse momentum via a wiper or via any other matching procedure. And we didn't manage to uh, achieve uh, um, a satisfactory flavor separation in the transverse momentum. Okay, so the uh, models that we chose for describing the low, uh, the low, the large BT or part of our uh, PDF is the following. So we had a weighted sum of two Gaussian distribution with the same widths for the TMD PDFs and different widths for the fragmentation functions. These functional forms are inspired by some model calculations with some references here. And but we have to say that maybe the form is also data driven. Okay, so the fact of having like one single width uh, for the uh, for the TMD PDF is essentially data driven. Okay, there are 11 free parameters. Some of the parameters are related to uh, the kinematic dependence of the G1, G3, and G4 parameters, which basically govern these distributions. And there is one parameter to describe the uh, perturbative part of the evolution, the G sub K kernel. <coughs> the G sub K kernel is a simple G2 times uh, BT square factor. Uh, there are more involved and, and um, refined functional forms that we should try and see them at work, but we stick to, to this simple one here. Also, uh, it's important to specify the functional form for the separation between the low BT and the large BT. It's important to have a Bmax cutoff to avoid the Landau pole. And it's also, we, we underst understood that it's rather important, also from the phenomenological point of view, to have a lower value for, for B. So the, um, the, B mean, uh, the B mean cutoff here is first of all needed from the theoretical point of view if you want to integrate your cross-section over QT and get the, the expression in collinear factorization. So that's, that's like a, 
uh, let's say, uh, something that we, we know from the formalism. We also know from the formalism that this beaming parameter goes like one over Q. And phenomenologically, we see that uh, it's rather important in, in semi-inclusive DIS because Q in semi-inclusive DIS is low. And this beaming can be, can be significant. Okay. Yeah. Yes. What's this mu b hat less than q? What you want to say there? The mean is proportional to one over q. Yeah, and if that implies it implies that uh, mu b is never larger than q in the so that when you when you evolve uh, in, in mu, the input scale never becomes larger than the final scale. Uh, otherwise, you would have a situation <coughs> where your core instead of emitting blue ones would absorb blue. Which is something weird. This is a good enhancement. It should be a subtraction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it would become an enhancement. Yeah. Okay. So, so to what accuracy does it recover the collinear factorization? Is it integrated or? Uh, um, I'm, I'm referring to the paper by by Leonard Allen Labradors, which actually showed it at at building or direct. That's correct. But in our formula, it's leading order. It's leading order. Yeah. Right, but I mean, uh, you're confused about the beam-in, the role of beam-in, because I mean, what happens if B, B goes to zero? If your B hat goes to beam-in, is that right? Yes. If yes. B goes to zero, B hat goes to So what happens to the exponent in that thing? No, so uh, to the pseudocarb, you mean? Oh, yes. Uh, it goes to zero. It goes to what? Zero? To zero, the exponential, so the exponent. So, so basically, you would integrate on a zero measure interval. So just the initial point becomes equal to the final point. So then your pseudocarb becomes one. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. yeah, no, that's for sure. But yeah, I was wondering whether there might be a finite remainder. That are, that are, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it would be what the power correction in the collinear yeah, power Yes. I think Leonard is going to talk about it for the yeah. polarized case. Yeah. yeah. But you're not going to talk about any local corrections in that. Well, or, or to some extent. Maybe I'll say okay. Okay, let's wait till tomorrow <laughs> or Wednesday. Okay, so but we, I mean, what I wanted to emphasize here is that we, we saw it, that it's important from the phenomenological point of view. Actually, without that, uh, we mean it's very difficult to describe the same thing with this data. Okay, so, um, okay, so this table uh, summarizes the uh, kinematic choices that we did. Uh, to describe, uh, the, yeah, to, to get a significant, to get a decent agreement. So you have to, to take out the low Q square values in order to, uh, let's say, for factorization to be applicable. Um, there are at least two, let's say, elephants in the room here. Uh, the first one is related to the definition of the fragmentation regions. So we were using, we were excluding low Z and high Z uh, data, but we know that distinction between current uh, target and the soft fragmentation region is more complicated. And probably this is only a subset. I mean, this, this selection corresponds to a specific case of the more general picture for certain values of Q. So like the, the divergent criterion is a specific case uh, of uh, you guys, if you choose Q equal to uh, to a specific value. Yeah. And the second one, uh, so for, for, for sure we have to rethink about it. Um, the second one is that uh, we were describing only the shape and not the normalization of compass data. At the time, only uh, the previous release of compass data for the unpolarized multiplicity was available where the normalization of the data was not correct. So we decided to avoid the problem of describing the normalization and look only at the, uh, at the Say the PP dependence. But now that the new data is available, uh, we should see what happens. And actually, I know that work is ongoing in that direction. Okay. 
um, the agreements, the colors are not really helping here, but the agreements, the overall agreement is uh, given by the sky square quantities of freedom of 1.5. And so we had, we had difficulties in describing Hermes data for pi on, uh, uh, sorry, proton to pi plus, and I guess also, yeah, deuteron to pi plus, so the pi plus data in the final state. Kaons behave a little bit better because of the large uncertainty in the final different functions, essentially. Uh, also, the chi-square for compass data is, is low, but that's because the fit is mainly driven by the compass data, which is like uh, 6,000 points out of 8,000, and because we were not fitting the normalization of just the shape. Uh, so we definitely have to see what happens with the new data, but this is what, what, what we have. Okay, so the, the slides uh, summarizes what we know regarding the values and the correlation between the average square transverse momentum from PMD PDF and the average square transverse momentum in, in fragmentation function. So the fit I discussed uh, is related uh, to the red region over here. We have many points because we have many different fits from the methodology. Um, if you compare the red region with respect to the, uh, the orange region, the first thing you notice is a, a, a decrease in the anti-correlation between the average k per square and the p per square. That's because the orange fit only involves some inclusive GIS data, where you essentially measure a sum of these two quantities here. Whereas in the red region, we also have data uh, that have pure information about TMD PDFs. So we managed to break the correlation between these two observables. And if we were to include uh, E plus and minus theta, we probably we will probably see that this is the correlation between the okay. So uh, these are the uh, kinematic dependencies of the average k, k per square as a function of x at one GB and excuse me, the z, z dependence of the average p per square. So I think Ralph this morning showed us a slide for this uh, uh, quantity, which I'm not saying is the same thing, but if the, the shape is, uh, is uh, comparable in a sense. If you had, you measured this width on uh, Monte Carlo data, right? This is, and it was, uh, uh, what was the energy scale? Um, what was the energy state? 10 or 100 GV. Yeah, whereas, yeah. yeah, whereas this is 1 GV. Okay. But uh, this is what, what it comes out from our feed. This is the zeta dependence of the uh, average quantum uh, square quantum momentum from the fragmentation functions. Okay. All right. So uh, if, we, if we look at uh, the future, I would say that the most urgent things to do are uh, understanding um, from the practical point of view how to separate uh, the fragmentation arrangements and use the IS. And, and Ted uh, nice, nicely explained us this morning uh, why it is important. Also, achieving a high order description of semi higher order description of semi-inclusive DIS at both at low QT and high QT separately or combined, I think it's, it's, it's very important. We have to understand if the formal is what's true in the, in the current fragmentation region. For whole processes, we have to be able sooner or later to match uh, the QCD description at low transverse momentum and high transverse momentum. And as I said, independent extraction of transverse momentum dependent fragmentation functions are, are very important. But also glue on TMDs, because uh, for, for uh, the quark uh, fragmentation functions, we are formalist, but not data yet. But for glue on TMDs, we have an effective formalist, and we also have some data from the LHC like double JPSI or, or, or double Upsilon production and this and so tell us something about it. And so we, we, have, we should be able to, to, to get some information uh, about the uh, PDFs as well. And also I think um, a faithful Monte Carlo implementation of the you know, sensitive processes is something very important, both from the theoretical and the experimental perspective. I think Marcus Dipentale uh, is gonna talk about it. So about TMD fragmentation function, I, I asked uh, this question this morning. So we have, um, um, Bell is going to give us data for uh, 
the PT dependence of one hadron with respect to the thrust axis, uh, but we have to understand carefully uh, what we are talking about from the point of view of the section. If it is a TMD in a jet, if it's a standard TMD, if it's pure nickel linear factorization or, or, or what else. The picture is clearer for E plus E minus into two hadron instead. It's definitely the TMD factorization. So data 4.2 will for sure be helpful about TMD, factor, uh, TMD fragmentation functions. From the theory point of view, we are working on the formalism, especially for point two, to prepare the ground for, for the forthcoming data. And together with uh, Ted and his student, Eric Moffat, we are working on the IQD limit factorization. So to see if we can describe, uh, let's say, the high QP limit at the fixed order calculation for this, uh, for this perception. So we, um, we are also comparing to PTR pseudo data, and Ansel knows a lot about it. Uh, I'll keep you posted in the next month. I don't want to show you anything. I don't want to tell you anything. But, okay, at slow QT, we see that we are able more or less to quantitatively reproduce uh, the data, the Monte Carlo. Okay, so glue and TMDs I will skip because time is running out, but Christian and uh, Asmita and Jan is there gonna talk about it. Uh, I wanna tell you something about the predictive power of TMDs, which is something I'm working on together with Jiang Wei, uh, uh, Zongbo, and his uh, former uh, undergraduate student. Okay, so uh, the, question, the question is the following. Suppose we get um, TMD, Let's talk about TMD PDFs from a global feed. Uh, in which kinematic regime are we able to use the result of this feed and precisely predict cross sections for different experiments? Or, on the contrary, in which kinematic window our TMDs are completely model dependent and so we cannot, uh, let's say, have precise predictions for, for, for processes? To understand, to answer to this question, we use the so called settle point approximation. Um, the saddle point approximation tells you that if you have an integral of this type, whether you have an exponential of a function f, in certain conditions, you can replace the integral evaluating uh, the integrand at a certain point x0, which is essentially the maximum of the function f, so the stationary, the stationary point for f. Okay, so we want to apply the same uh, technique to a TMD PDF at kt equals zero, so we recast the, the form of the TMD PDF at kt equals zero in the same form. And um, we can find the uh, saddle point of the TMD PDF, basically studying the stationary point of this guy here between the curly brackets. So we have different ingredients in this equation that determines the saddle point. The first two involve gamma f and k, so the two evolution, the anomalous dimensions for the evolution and they generate the scale dependence of the saddle point. The last piece here generates an X dependence of the saddle point, because it involves the collinear PDF and the Wilson coefficients. The philosophy is the following. So if the saddle point in this space is towards the low B region, it means that your TMD PDF is dominated by the perturbative calculation. So the, more, the, the lower the saddle point is, the more the PDF is dominated by the Perturbative so in principle, we should know how to calculate the function. The higher the saddle point, the more the non-perturbative corrections are important. So the more the TMD PDF becomes model dependent. So you cannot really make predictions with that. Okay, let's look at how to solve this equation. Uh, this is not like a new uh, problem. Uh, Parisi, Petronzio, and, CS and the CSS studied it back in the days, 1979 and 1982. But they only looked at the two terms that generate the scale dependence. So without looking at the X dependence. Um, and they were doing it at the level of the cross section. We are doing it at the level of the single TMD PDF. So if you, if you solve this equation at leading log, you, you understand basically that the saddle point has this kind of functional form as a function of Q, which tells you that the saddle point decreases when Q is large which corresponds to our intuitive picture that uh, uh, the non-perturbative corrections are not that important when Q is large, okay. Um, Jiang Wei and his former postdoc 
Fang in 2001. They did the same calculation at the level of the cross section. And they also included this term here, which generates the X dependence. We repeat the same at the level of the TMD PDF. And if you work again at heating log, you find this kind of functional form, which is exactly identical to the previous one, apart from the factor curly X here. The curly X is essentially the logarithmic derivative of the PDF with respect to the energy scale. So the, um, uh, this tells you that the, the position of the certain point changes both with Q and with X. And according to the sign of this derivative, you see that the certain point goes towards the perturbative region or the non-perturbative region, even when Q is fixed. So it's not, this, it's not completely correct that when you are at high Q, your non-perturbative corrections are non-important. When you are at high Q, it depends on the X values if you are completely predictive or, or if your TMD PDF is more independent. Okay, before showing you some numerical uh, uh, calculation here, I'm gonna tell you about how we deal with the large BT corrections. So one, one second. Yes. Go back. Um, so that is, um, that is the same result as John Blaise's result from 2001, or I mean? Uh, John Blaise's result was at the level of the cross section. Yeah, but does that make a difference at all? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't completely, but, uh, so this is the leading log solution, but we are going also to a, to a higher order solution. And in general, as a result, this uh, curly X is going to be a product of uh, PDFs, but in this one, it is a single PDF. Mm -hmm. It's also, what? Yeah. It should be some number, yeah, yes, but I mean, it's yeah. similar here. So the number is going to be the same, right? So function effects. Uh, and then in John Bay, I think it was function effects one is to maybe the third I mean, it's, it's not exactly the same thing because at the level of the cross section, you have two TMDs. So let's say your, your distribution in this space is more squeezed towards the low The thing in the physics that the, yeah. the X dependent is corresponding to the phase space. And you <coughs> have a large phase space to shower, mm -hmm. and you effectively push it to what you expect the large PT mm -hmm. or more fertility. So whether or not you treat at a cross section level, how we or treat in the um, uh, TMD level. It's yeah. equivalent, yeah. of course, but it shows you, I mean, treating at the level of the TMT PDF, uh, uh, I would say it's, uh, I think it gives a guidance to, uh, let's say, uh, when we talk about the relevance of the non-perturbative correction in TMT, sometimes the arguments are a bit hand -waving. I think this gives you like more quantitative you know, uh, answer to that. But then you would have two separate saddle points, right? I mean, if you have a combination of TMDs and a cross section. Well, it depends on it depends on x, q, and the rapid shoot. For the principle, of yeah. and then you just take the integral of protocols and mm. all these kinds. So. Yes, <clears throat> and also the funding. One interesting thing I think is you can here you you can test what happens if you have only the big labs taking turns or the BFL taking turns. You see what the what, what, what the difference can be. Okay, so the, how, how to model the large PT correction? Uh, the form of F and P is a choice, but what we choose uh, is the following. So below B max, we, uh, we, we calculate the TMD PDF with the Wilson coefficients per, per, perturbatively. Uh, when BT is larger than B max, we freeze the value at B max and we stick a model. This model is uh, built in the following way. You have a first term here, which is an extrapolation term, and then you have uh, a term which is related to the correction proportional to Q squared, so it's the uh, non-perturbative correction to the evolution, and this G2 bar here is basically the intrinsic component, so it's the intrinsic correction. The interesting thing about the extrapolation term is that you can actually fix G1 and alpha as a function of G2, G2 bar, and B max, imposing the continuity of the first and the second derivative in B max. So the idea here is the following. If you keep B max sufficiently low, you have a way to guide basically the behavior in the large BT part, which is driven by the perturbative calculation. So it's, 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 like, a, it's like an extrapolation of the uh, perturbative results into the large BT region. 
that can be trusted if you are sure that Emacs is really in the, in the perfect position. Okay, so yeah, as I said, this is the correction to evolution and that's the, the intrinsic process. Okay, let me show you some results. Okay, this is a gluon TMD PDF when the scale is equal to the Higgs boson mass. The, uh, you, you cannot see it, I think, but you cannot see the line here. Uh, so this was the, the CSS-like solution. Um, but let me tell you that the orange curve is the, our solution at leading log, and that you can see when the derivative with respect to the energy scale is uh, positive, actually the curve uh, decreases and when it's negative, it increases. So when you go to larger X, your saddle point basically uh, can go towards the, uh, the non-perturbative, uh, the large BT uh, values. So in the Higgs case, when, when Q is equal to 125 GeV, of course, everything more or less is below one GeV. The saddle point is below one GeV. So you, that's the case where the predictive power is, uh, is the strongest. But if you lower the hard scale, if you, if you look at, for example, 9 GeV, you see that in order to be below 1 GeV or below 0.5 GeV, you have to go to smaller X values. If you go, if you study the J Psi, you have to go, you have to go, you, have to go you can also, you can also do the same uh, for quarks. And one thing you notice is that uh, for an up quark at the Z boson mass, uh, the saddle point never goes below 0.5 GeV. Uh, and this is different with respect to the peak scale. So we kind of expect that because the, the, the showering for gluons can be stronger. So the evolution for the gluons is, is, uh, is more dominant. So the, the color dots are the calculation at next to next to leading log and next to next to leading order with some coefficient. And you see that when, uh, if you say, for example, if you are at nine GeV, uh, when the saddle point drifts toward the large BT region, you start to be model dependent. So the TMD can have a dependence on the parameters that you put into the model. Okay. So, and this is the case for the, for the, uh, for the, the JPSI production, where you basically are never predictive because the minimum value of the saddle point is like one inverse GB when X is uh, 10 to the minus four. Okay, so if we want to summarize the, uh, if we want to summarize what I told you now, if, we, if you think again about the X and Q square plane, we have the strongest predictive power when we sit at high Q and very small X. Whereas the relevance of the non-perturbative correction is uh, stronger when you, are, when you are at low Q and large X. Namely when, um, this, is, this is actually the uh, kinematic window where we try to keep the MDs. I mean, not having predictive power is not necessarily a bad thing. If you want to fit in this, you have, your data have to be sensitive to the details of them. So this tells us that it's better to be, uh, let's say, at high X with respect to small X if you want to look at the details of the non-perturbative correction to be in this. So, uh, for example, um, these are data about the Collins and the Sievers asymmetry. And I think it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that, for example, for, uh, for W boson production at peak, uh, you get data which are at high Q, so the approximation related to the TMD factorization can be under control. And these data also sit at high X. And high X, we, we have, I already, I just told you that the non perturbative interactions are enhanced. So I think it's, I, I'm urging our colleagues from Rick also to give us like the unpolarized, uh, to produce unpolarized data, which would be very useful. It's worse. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a test of the um, Z boson production at the LHC at 13 TeV in a, in a very forward rapidity uh, regime. So as I told you, we, are, we were dealing with X and Q, but also the rapidity here. Because if you are in forward rapidity, actually your X Despite root of S being 13 TV, your X can be significantly large. So you see that using, just using the extrapolation part in the large BT region, so without any non perturbative correction, you can describe pretty well the QT spectrum of the Z boson, but you kind of overshoot the points around the peak. So um, this can be a signal of the fact that when you had a large X, you anyway would need an unperturbative correction to, to uh, describe your data. 
Yes. What is the accuracy of that? Next. Say it again. What is the accuracy of the? This is next to next reading log and next to next reading order in the W term. So I flow from the two methods. So how, how big is your plan? I didn't test it here yet, but it shouldn't be very large because it's an next to next reading order calculation. It's also 4G. It's what? It's also at the region of 4G B where you would not expect the most error, right? Yeah, but I mean, it shouldn't be like, uh, it shouldn't be from six to 12, right? It should be narrower. No, it's about 15%. 15? Okay. But I, did, I didn't fully test it yet. So. But this is to say that, I mean, you can reproduce very well the data just after the peak without any unperturbative correction, but in photo rapidity, you need something else. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean that when you go to high Q, small X, when you are predictive, you, you don't have to care about an unperturbative correction. It all boils down to what the precision of your observable is. So for example, we just showed that if you want to measure the W boson mass of the LHC, for example, you definitely need to take into account the non-perturbative correction. And in particular, we show that the flavor, the composition is important. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's over. <laughs> okay, you can read the conclusions, yes. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any some discussion or do we have two minutes for discussion? So I'm inspired actually by <clears throat> Martin Savage, who said never be 